History's Forged in Fire is an extremely successful show, and with this comes a specific recipe for success. By giving the contestants a type of sword to make, a specific amount of time to make it, then a live action test of the weapons, we are shown the process from start to finish. With swords having been used for thousands of years as some of the most deadly weapons available, each will have to go through a specifically tailored test to analyze their durability, appearance, and ergonomics. In this video, we will be highlighting 10 forged in fire tests that you won't believe actually exist. So make sure to leave a like, hit subscribe, and see if you agree with what we put at number 1. Number 1. The Grim Reaper Scythe as far as this show's many weapons of choice goes, the thought of seeing a bizarre weapon doesn't surprise us anymore, but when the contestants are asked to present a well-crafted Grim Reaper scythe, it becomes clear that we are in for a real treat. Now to be clear, a scythe is an agricultural hand tool used for mowing grass or the cutting of crops. While in Forge and Fire, it isn't exactly used for cutting any crops or mowing any grass, but they do use the Grim Reaper scythes to cut open realistic human dummies. Though it is quite entertaining to watch each dummy get ripped and sliced open, the scythes do end up getting quite a bit of a beating when they're put against the strength test. After batoning Chase's blade, the blade ends up breaking only after 4 hits. You can even see the chipping of the blade while it was put under strenuous pressure against the baton. Luckily for Brandon, his blade survives 4 strikes against the blade of the scythe and passes the strength test, leaving Brandon to be the winner of this episode. <laughs> Number 2. The Zand Spears Spears are probably what you'd think of when you're trying to describe deadly projectiles. They were used all throughout history and often when fishing. Now for the Zand Spear? Most definitely a deadly weapon of choice. Now, the Zand Spear consists of an iron spearhead with a rounded tip and a narrow blade, gradually expanding to its base, which ends in two long downward facing barbs. To make sure it does optimal damage, the tip of one is then broken off. With a description like that, no wonder it was used in the late 1800s. As shown in Forge and Fire, the spear ended up tearing apart the dummies, splitting apart their bones inside, and tearing out their fake organs. When put up against the strength test, Drew's spear performed beautifully. It stayed firmly intact when it pierced the wood. Drew's spear went over 5 inches into the wooden wall. Now for Jason's spear, there really wasn't much to say. It wasn't even able to be tested due to the dimensions of the handle, and ultimately, he was disqualified. It's a shame to not even get to see how the spear would have held up against the strength test. Number 3. The Horseman's Axe With a name like that, its looks are quite suiting for it. But while the name alone is rather intriguing, the way that they're presented, and normally made, is a factor to consider as well. Most horsemen's axes have a short curved blade at the front which is balanced with a hammer or spike, often called a pick, on the other side of the axe blade. Now when forging for weapons, the durability of the base and the blade of the weapon is a must when you're wanting the weapon to stay intact. And for Mike, it's obvious he wasn't paying attention to the rod of the axe. When put up against the strength test, Mike falls out short against the ice. It gets only 9 hits in when the axe snaps and gets flung from the base of the weapon, hitting the floor with a clang. You can see the visible pain in Mike's face, which brings quite a bit of pain to our hearts, as the strength test is often what ruins many weapons crafted on the show. Number 4. The Hooded Guitar If you haven't heard of what a guitar is, it's a type of push dagger from the Indian subcontinents. It can often be identified by the H-shaped handle it bears. Now imagine putting a cover over the length of the handle, and suddenly it becomes a hooded guitar. That's exactly what the contestants were asked to make on this episode of Forge and Fire. While none of the weapons broke in this round, which was surprising, Ryan's guitar was far too dull, not even slicing through the skin of a pig, presented in the kill test. Though it held up well through the strength and sharpness test, it failed due to how dull it was. So Nicholas, you're up first. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Let's do it. Number 5. The Sika Sword 
Forged in Fire is well known for its bizarre assortment of weapons crafted in its many episodes, and this short sword definitely belongs. The shape of this sword is quite odd, but works well for piercing through flesh. It's one of the most noticeable features, which separates it from many other swords around it. The Sika was a short sword or large dagger of the ancient Tharkarians. Decianus? The Sika was a short sword or large dagger of the ancient Tharkarians, Decarians, or Lilarians, while also being used in ancient Rome. Its origins are based in the Hallstatt culture, which dates back to the 12th and 8th century BC. Facts about the long dagger aside, in the episode, the judges test each of the contestants' weapons, first putting it up against the kill test. Frank's blade goes up first, taking only two strikes against the neck of the dummy to slice through completely. The head ends up being sliced clean off, making it apparent that the Sika sword is not a weapon to mess with. All right, Frank, you're up first. You ready? Oh, yes. Number 6, the War Golox. The name alone makes the weapon sound powerful, and when looking at the weapon, it can be quite an odd pair, but the strength of this Filipino and machete is what helped it obtain its name. The War Golok is the only sword that ever existed in the Philippines that did not have a pointy tip at the end of it, making it quite unique. When the contestants on Forge and Fire are asked to present a War Golok of their own, they definitely deliver, as both pass the kill test. Now as for surviving the strength test, Matt's war golok doesn't do so well. The blade is shown to have bent in a way that it ends up curving inwards towards the handle and ultimately fails. For Matt, this means taking a loss and ends up sending him home. Number 7, the wind and fire blades. A ring normally is something that you've placed around your finger or for decoration, but these ring-shaped blades are used in close combat. The wind and fire wheels are melee weapons, wielded as a pair, and associated with Chinese martial arts. Disciplines such as Bagwasong and Tai Chi use this weapon extensively. Once the weapons are presented to the judges on Forge and Fire, they are put up against the kill test. Rebel's blades go first, slicing through the pig carcasses relatively easily, showing no sign of breaking. The same cannot be said for Chucks. As the blades are being tested, one of the blades breaks off the handle, showing how easily breakable they can be when they aren't properly crafted or to the best of their ability. In the strength test, another blade is sacrificed and breaks off easily, barely getting through it. Number 8. The Glev Gizarm. This weapon is of French descent and was adapted from farming tools. Its long length made it ideal for foot soldiers fighting mounted cavalry. When Nick's weapon is put up against the kill test, it passes with flying colors, slicing through the deer carcasses in two clean cuts. When Alex's weapon is put up to the test, it makes a clean slice through the rib of the carcass but is unable to cut cleanly through the waist of the deer. This would ultimately be what brings him down against the sharpness test, as it barely cuts through any of the wood poles. In the end, Alex fails against Nick's weapon, and he is sent home. Number 9, the Pipe Tomahawk. A beautiful weapon when crafted well, the Pipe Tomahawk is just that, a smoking pipe mixed with a tomahawk. The original tomahawk was and still is an Indian tool with a wooden handle and a metal blade. And this pipe ain't for peace. On Forge and Fire, the judges put the tomahawks to the smoke test, the kill test, the strength test, and the sharpness test. Funnily enough, they put it through the smoke test, testing the smoke pipe and finding that it works perfectly. As well as this, when they're put up against the kill test, they perform perfectly as well. As for the strength test, Mike's tomahawks are put up against a wooden wall the wall leaving a bit of delamination on one of the weapons. But when Cody's tomahawks are put up against the strength test, they pass amazingly, though one of them is smaller than the other. In the end, Mike ultimately claims victory as his blades were well crafted and symmetrical. Number 10, the Zweihandler Sword. This sword's name is quite a mouthful, but it's quite the beautiful blade. 
The Zweihandler sword was a large, two-handed sword that was primarily used during the early decades of the 16th century. It's quite a long blade, and when put up against the sharpness test, it cuts beautifully. Both swords end up passing the sharpness test, cutting many of the sugarcane poles and leaving considerable damage behind. When put up against the kill test, Junior's sword goes to the dummy with ease and disembowels the stomach with one strike. Steven's sword, on the other hand, hits the ribs of the dummy on its first strike and completely disembowels the bunny, showing how deadly this weapon could be in combat. But as there can only be one winner, Steven is victorious and leaves Junior to be the failure of this round. Thank you everyone for tuning in to Film Trip. Don't forget to leave a like, press subscribe, and comment below if you agree or disagree with our list.